Shweta, we're going to be moving into the special address space. The critical role of global networking in promoting the therapeutic use of dance movement therapy and creative arts therapies. So we have with us uh, three very special guests who will be joining us right now. And uh, it is my go ahead and introduce them to you one by one. So of our three guests who've joined us here today, first up, I'm going to welcome someone who is in the U.S. Consulate in Kolkata, and she's responsible for activities that articulate U.S. foreign policy and promote greater mutual understanding between the United States and India. Prior to this, she has served various diplomatic roles in the U.S. of A, Dhaka, and New Delhi. And before becoming a diplomat, she taught language and literature in New York. She's accompanied by her daughter in Kolkata. Please put your hands together as we welcome right now Director, American Center, and Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Consulate, Kolkata, joining us. Please put your hands together for Monica Shai. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We're going to invite you to take your, your special address forward. Okay, so um, I wasn't sure if you wanted to introduce everyone first, but um, I'm, happy. I'm happy to begin. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and, and, for, um, and for giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, some of the ways that, that, uh, that we use um, kind of arts and culture uh, to advance diplomacy and foreign policy goals, which is, which is the angle um, that I'm going to bring to the conversation tonight. Um, at the U.S. Consulate Kolkata and at the American Center, our mandate, of course, is to strengthen the U.S.-India relationship. Um, by promoting shared goals, shared values. Uh, the American Center, although it does function as the cultural arm of the U.S. Consulate, it's also responsible for advancing our foreign policy priorities. In Eastern India, these include working together to prevent trafficking in persons and promoting women's economic inclusivity for both of our nations to prosper. We also work on diverse issues such as Indo-Pacific cooperation, countering disinformation, and higher education partnerships. Some in the foreign policy community don't see a role for the arts in these endeavors. But my experience proves every day that the arts are critical to all that we do because it is the arts that connect us as human beings. From a diplomatic public engagement perspective, the US Consulate Kolkata believes strongly that arts and culture are not tangential, but rather essential for building community supporting development, nurturing health and well-being, and contributing to economic opportunity. Art forms express and embody culture, and in whatever form they take, they provide a lens through which we can better understand and make meaning of our present circumstances, including our social, economic, and political environments, whether that is the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States or pandemic-related migration in India. Art has poured forth as an outlet for these intense emotional upheavals in our two societies. Cultural expression draws us together as human beings. I have found that in my role as a diplomat, it is the creative arts that most easily create connections across geographic, linguistic, and economic boundaries. From grassroots movements to the highest levels of international decision-making, the arts are influential. In 2019, during our eighth annual anti-tip conclave in Kolkata, we emphasized the voices of survivor leaders. Leveraging the US Department of State's Education and Cultural Affairs Arts Envoy program, we brought digital storytelling experts from the United States to work with eight trafficking okay. survivors. Sorry? Uh, we brought digital storytelling experts from the United States to work with eight trafficking survivors to help them tell their stories. These stories became eight films. And those films have now been viewed by 8,000 law enforcement officials, 2,000 child protection officers, and 700 judges in Eastern India. 
NGOs tell us that the films have resulted not only in more sympathetic treatment of trafficking victims, but also increased arrests and prosecutions. The arts influence outlook and behavior. For a long time, lawmakers were apathetic to the issue of human trafficking. It was the biggest problem. But when we raise the issue through culture, through arts, through sports, then people listen. At the beginning of this year, along with the NGO Shakti Vihini, we organized the East India Field Hockey Camp for 107 tribal girls from heavily trafficked districts in Jharkhand, partnering with South Eastern Railways and with the Jharkhand Criminal Investigation Department. The camp caught the interest of our U.S. Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs, who happened to be visiting Delhi around that time. Canceling other plans, she made the trip out to Ranchi, Jharkhand, to see the final tournament and hear the stories of the girls who participated. She spoke at the awards ceremony about the effective use of sports and community partnerships to strengthen safety nets against human trafficking. Jharkhand's chief minister, Hemant Soren, also took notice. After meeting with camp participants and their U.S. hockey coaches, Chief Minister Soren announced in a press release that human trafficking would be a priority issue for his new government. This, my friends, is how culture influences policy. A couple of years back, our Border Narratives Project brought together youth voices from India and Bangladesh with New York-based Bond Street Theater to look at how women have shown leadership and resilience through border conflicts, migration, and economic recession across the globe. In a roundtable with several think tank leaders following the program, a key U.S. exchange alumna and foreign policy expert, Dr. Sri Radhadatta, pointed out that the foreign policy community rarely acknowledges the impact of culture and its critical role in shaping security infrastructure of a region, in this case, the Indo-Pacific. As a result of that conversation, we are now pursuing an Indo-Pacific dialogue for artists. In the coming year, this project will create a convergence of regional experts, academics, and think tank leaders, along with artists, musicians, and authors from across the Indo-Pacific region to create intercultural dialogues, art installations, choreographic pieces that capture important conversations around security, governance, and economies. While we often bring in academic experts and policymakers to define a vision, we know that the arts can be a powerful medium to convey ideas and change behavior. Conversations through the arts can highlight the need for free and open Indo-Pacific, where all nations benefit from regional partnerships. I would be remiss here if I didn't speak about our decade-long relationship with Sean Fade. They have partnered with us on several of our annual anti-tip conclaves, and we have welcomed them into the American Center to conduct workshops and programs in partnership with the West Bengal government. The strong survivor voices that have emerged through performances and follow-on discussions have inspired audiences and received media attention that spread the messages to millions. Not least of all, the state government's Ministry of Women and Child Welfare, which now recognizes the importance of bringing survivor voices to the table for discussions about rehabilitation and integration. With, cultural in, with, with culture and the arts, the results are not always immediate. But when they come, they are long lasting. While I could keep going with example after example, I'll just share one last story from a renowned anti-trafficking activist who re recently wrote a book about murals produced during, I'm sorry, who recently wrote about a mural produced during our 2016 anti-tip conclave. Kevin Bales is a professor of contemporary slavery and research director of the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham in the UK. His latest project, the anti-slavery unusable project, or I'm sorry, the anti-slavery Usable Past Project unearths the lessons of historic abolitionism for contemporary use to advance the movement against contemporary global slavery. It's an interesting project. I encourage you to take a look. Murals focused on resistance, empowerment, and slavery are part of that project. And the following is an excerpt from Kevin Bales' publication. Historically, when a mural was created, a dedication ceremony took place. This tradition still rings true today when we see grand unveilings of murals in the street or in public buildings. 
Individuals gather, dedicate the mural, and occasionally have a street festival. At least, this was the done thing back in the 1960s. The dedication ceremony of the Wall of Respect celebrating Black American culture lasted nearly a week back in 1967, with eight famous dancers, poets, musicians, and artists all showing up to celebrate Black heritage. These festivals and dedication ceremonies are important, and for contemporary slavery mural movement, they are integral moments to raise awareness and impart further information regarding the scale of contemporary slavery and human trafficking. As an example of this happening today comes from Joel Artista. In 2016, Joel journeyed to the Eastern Indian state of West Bengal. Beautiful landscapes and incredible mountainous views greeted Joel, but they weren't the reason for his visit. Behind the veil of natural beauty in West Bengal lies the epicenter of human trafficking in South Asia, where tens of thousands of people a year are taken from their communities and trafficked through Siliguri en route to their various destinations. The human trafficking in West Bengal takes many forms. Women and underage girls are sold into sex slavery, others are forced to marry older men, and both men and women are sold into forced labor, usually agricultural laborers and domestic maids, respectively. Whilst work is being done by NGOs, law enforcement, the Indian government, and the international community, the problem rages on inspiring Joel to visit the area and paint a large scale mural in a highly visible location in order to raise awareness of the issue. The mural depicts a formerly trafficked woman named Sangeeta. She is a dancer and now works with Kolkata Shongbed, an organization that uses dance as a form of therapy for trafficking survivors. As a part of this organizational work, a photographer by the name of Brooke Shaden works with women and girls to help them create a series of self-portraits that represent the women's individual voices. Selecting the poses themselves, Shangita chose an outstretched pose. A threatening hand is gripping her ankle while she extends her arm forward towards another hand for help and support. Moved by this image, Joel Artista gained permission to use it in his mural. Joel created the mural in tandem with the U.S. Consulate Kolkata's 2016 International Anti-Human Trafficking Conclave. And on the opening day of the event, a crowd of people gathered in front of the mural surrounded by local musicians and dancers, including a group of women who were human trafficking survivors. To Joel, the festival was an inspiring moment to witness the power of people who have gone through so much, yet were determined to be part of the solution and support others who have suffered. And this example proves why murals are so much more than just an image in the street. They have the ability to bring people together from a multitude of backgrounds and raise awareness of contemporary slavery in a creative, emotional, and collaborative way that fosters important international ties. This is the way we are going to rid the world of contemporary slavery. If we, from all walks of life, pull together in the same direction, we can ensure no human being is owned, sold, trafficked, or forced into labor. That's the end of the excerpt. The idea of human beings from all walks of life pulling together in the same direction really captures the spirit and the power of culture and the arts. I'll wrap this up with this. Long before I was a diplomat, I was an English teacher to an, at an underprivileged high school in New York City. Why do we study literature, my students would ask on the first day of class. Throughout the semester, we read books by people very different from them, people who lived across the globe, in societies removed by time and place. We read books by people who practiced other religions, defined sexuality differently, or lived under foreign political regimes. Through the narratives, our shared humanity became evident. By the end of the class, my best students could tell me why we read those books. Through books, one girl wrote, we can understand people who are not like us. We can feel compassion for each other as human beings. In my role as a diplomat, these goals continue to guide my work. Mutual understanding, mutual compassion. As we seek to build relationships and strengthen international ties, what better tool could I leverage than culture and the arts? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Monica Shai, for uh, giving us such a rounded perspective 
on global networking and, and especially how you, you've been trying to interweave it with DMT and CAT and especially your relationship with Kolkata Shomvir. So appreciate your sharing this evening. Uh, we're going to welcome now our, our next speaker who is a student of linguistics, German literature, MA, sociology, political science and pedagogics in Aceh and Bonn. He has been working with the Goethe Institute since 2006 after receiving training in Northern Africa, taking post as director in Sudan and Sri Lanka and working for three years at the Munich head office. He is currently the director of the Goethe Institute Max Müller Bhavan in Mumbai since March 2019. I invite everybody, all our participants at home, to put your hands together and welcome right now Director Gothe Institute, Max Müller Bhavan, Mumbai, Bjorn Kettles. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, good evening. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, since uh, March last year, I'm having the pleasure of heading the Goethe Institute Max Müller Bhavan here in Mumbai, which is one of our uh, seven Indian institutes. And uh, it is uh, the youngest. Last year we celebrated 50 years in Mumbai. And uh, as you might know, we are very much an institution of uh, cultural dialogue and cultural exchange. We are not that much uh, a cultural diplomacy institution. And uh, we are very much rooted in the cultural scenes uh, of the cities where we are working. And um, talking about uh, the dance movement uh, therapy uh, project line, which we have started in uh, 2007, it involved not only the institutes in Mumbai, it basically started in Calcutta uh, under the director, uh, my fellow colleague, uh, Martin Welder, who later became the director here in Mumbai. And um, yeah, you can see that uh, the Goethe Institute uh, is uh, yeah, now for 30 years um, part of um, promoting uh, dance movement therapy in India in various ways. And uh, I'm quite happy that uh, I have inherited this project uh, when I started in Mumbai last year, beside many other interesting projects which are more focusing on uh, uh, visual arts, photography and uh, also other field of arts here in Mumbai. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure that uh, I have been invited to say a few words. Um, and uh, it's nice to see that uh, the discussions are still that vivid on a Sunday evening at seven o'clock. Uh, having a look at your schedule, I've seen you started quite early. so. Um, it's nice to see that uh, in these days where we are all on Zoom, Skype, and all these platform, platforms all the time, that you're not getting tired, that the discussion is still fully going on. Um, today, I haven't prepared um, a formal speech. Uh, I was invited to talk about uh, the Goethe Institute's uh, contribution to dance movement therapy um, in the past years. And um, this is, uh, I, I do that happily. Our partnership uh, with Kolkata Sambit started, uh, as I mentioned, in 2007 already. And um, now we are looking back to a fruitful collaboration of uh, 13 years, which is a quite rare thing for an institution, which is usually um, we are more working on shorter term projects, uh, uh, productions, which have a clear beginning and a clear end. In this case, we are part of an ongoing process which started uh, as a small scale collaboration in uh, Calcutta with Calcutta uh, Sunwet and led later to the Goethe Institute support of uh, the Dance Movement Therapy Diploma Program which is run jointly by Kolkata Sunwet and the Center of Lifelong Learning at TIS. So in the early times of our collaboration in 2007, um, the aim of this rather small scale collaboration was showcasing the vital role of dance movement th therapy for change in the Indian context. And uh, since then, uh, the Goethe Institute has regularly supported Kolkata Sunwet in Kolkata and Mumbai 
in extending their activities. And um, the Goethe Institute has increased uh, the international reach and credibility of Hakata Sunwitz dance, uh, uh, dance movement therapy model by um, giving access to dance and da dance movement therapy, uh, therapy expertise from Germany. And uh, one of these, yeah, one of the highlights in this early period of collaboration was for sure um, the visit of uh, Pina Bausch, who worked with Sunbet in 2007 during her uh, India trip. Then the next big step uh, followed in 2015 where Goethe Institute, Max Miller one extended their support to the Dance Movement Therapy Diploma Program, uh, jointly run by Kolkata Sunbet and the Center of Lifelong Learning as part of uh, the capacity building initiatives. And um, Dr. Martin Welde, who uh, has left Calcutta those days already and uh, took over the Institute in Mumbai, was a crucial part of uh, this early times of starting the um, diploma program here in Mumbai. For the Goethe Institute, it's quite, uh, or it, it was when we uh, started working in uh, the field of capacity building, which is um, not the core of uh, what the Goethe Institute used to do in the past. Uh, a, lot, a lot of colleagues have seen it quite uh, uh, critical to um, get involved in arts for something. So I can remember when I joined the Goethe Institute and we started under, um, uh, under uh, the umbrella of arts and uh, development to work in uh, this field of um, applied arts um, that a lot of my colleagues were critical and uh, uh, yeah, have rather seen the Goethe Institute in, a, um, in, in, in the realm of uh, aesthetics rather than um, promoting arts as a tool to achieve social change, to use it for therapy and all the other ways. Uh, uh, arts can be successfully used as uh, you prove every day in your work in dance movement therapy. Um, the Goethe Institute facilitated uh, mostly over uh, the past year, since 2015, access to visiting faculty from Germany for teaching in the program and uh, two experts who uh, took part in this uh, exchange are very well known to you since they are also part of this summit, Martina Pfiff and Dr. Marianne Eberhard Kechele. And uh, the great exit also facilitated the travel of um, Suhini Chakraborty, director of uh, Kolkata Sunbet, to be part of a DMT summit in Germany. And um, the last uh, big contribution on this very visible level was uh, Goethe Institute supporting the first summit um, of dance movement therapy for change in Delhi in 2016. Uh, I had the pleasure last year to meet uh, Martina Pfiff here in Mumbai and uh, we had a, a long talk about uh, the history and her involvement in the program of de developing the diploma program and uh, the Goethe Institute, uh, as I said, is quite proud of being part of this success story. And uh, uh, one of the ways we are um, going to uh, support the program is the future, in the future is uh, the alumni programs, uh, like the one which is now happening online. But uh, we want to keep that uh, bridge to um, Germany uh, working, we want to keep it productive so we will uh, make sure that also in the future for um, meetings like this, uh, we are supporting that uh, the experts are taking part in these activities, hopefully uh, in the future also uh, again in a physical space and not online um, to share best practice and uh, yeah, discuss um, what can be what can be done to uh, make the work of therapists in uh, India as well as in Germany 
uh, more successful, um, I think uh, the exchange always goes to both ways. Uh, all the experts who came to India uh, to teach in the program for sure took uh, also back a lot of lessons learned and best practice uh, to Germany, um, which is useful for their uh, work and research there. Yeah, um, that as a rough um, overview of what the Goethe Institute has been done over the past years um, as a part of this, yeah, I have to say it's a program line, Dance Movement Therapy for Change, uh, I would like to thank uh, Suhini Chakravarti from Kolkata Sambet and uh, Sabia Vasi from TIS for uh, this uh, yeah, great collaboration over all these years. And uh, we are very much looking forward to continue working with you. And it's uh, great to see um, what a large uh, enthusiastic network you are having now following events uh, like this. Uh, after you started with uh, not much more than an idea and a lot of enthusiasm uh, years ago. Uh, congratulations from our side and um, I hope this uh, uh, summit so far uh, was as successful as uh, all of the activities uh, we have been joining in the past. That's all from my side. Thank you so much, Mr. Kettles, for um, actually, you know, acknowledging the amazing relationship that uh, y'all have had and enjoyed with uh, Kolkata Shomved over the years, a, a relationship that began in 2007 and still continues. So thank you so much for being here this evening. And um, up next, we're going to welcome somebody who's responsible for developing strategies and programs to promote and strengthen India-UK cultural relations through creative partnerships. Someone who has substantial experience in theater producing, arts management, and international cultural exchange, and was a guest lecturer at various places in London and in Minnesota. He has been in leadership positions at several theaters and museums in the UK, where he has overseen major redevelopment programs. We wanna welcome right now, Director Arts India, British Council. Jonathan Kennedy joins us on screen. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Keisha, and many thanks. And thanks to my uh, colleagues from the United States and Germany for their uh, previous uh, uh, interventions as well. So just by way of background, British Council is the UK's international organization for culture and educational relations. And this is echoed in our current programs in crafts and design heritage and arts festivals in India. We bring together UK and India partners to collaborate on projects which aim to strengthen the creative economy through innovation. Our work aims to empower arts and culture for creative expression, exchange and enterprise in the creative industries, strengthening skills for future leaders and market development. We partner with emerging and established festivals on major platforms for creative exchange between India and the UK. And in the summer this year, the British Council was delighted to partner with Kolkata Shanved on the Field Festival. Field Festival stood for the Festival of Empowerment of Arts for Life. It was really good to see how young audiences and artists who specialize in arts therapy in the UK and India worked together in a joint force with Kolkata Shanved. 2020 has, with the COVID-19 pandemic, has been a really difficult and troubling year. And the Field Festival made an important contribution to discussion around arts for well-being and mental health, as well as busting some myths around the stigma of mental health. I applaud Kolkata Shanved's ambition for healthy, violence-free, gender equal, creative society of empowered individuals. This International Dance Summit and well, for Wellbeing today is a sign of greater progress towards enlarging the network and understanding the ecosystem for dance movement therapy for change across India and South Asia, 
with creative leaders and change makers in the field, especially those from underprivileged, less privileged communities. As Monica Shea will, will already know, President Obama in the US said some years back, he spoke of the empathy deficit, an inability to, or, or unwillingness to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. This international summit today addresses very publicly a call for kindness, compassion, creativity, and understanding of the challenges many people face at the margins of society. And this summit explores how art and culture can help as a form of therapy and well-being. Whether you are an, an artist, a participant, or an audience member, in the UK, there's a movement called 66 Million Artists, which imagines if all of the UK population were artists and had access to creative participation, how different the country might be. The new national education policy in India places art and learning and skills heritage and skills for heritage into the curriculum for the first time. At the moment, one can only imagine if all children and students and families had access to the arts, how this would enable deeper understanding and empathy for each other's stories and the many different cultures living side by side in India and the West. In recent months, I've seen some wonderful examples of how arts, storytelling, music and dance together in India can be a balm for peace, reconciliation and understanding in troubled times for individuals and their communities. And we've been proud to support at the British Council festivals such as Where Have All the Flowers Gone in Manipur and the I Believe Art Matters campaign across India they were shining examples, along with the many other acts of individual kindness, supporting artists and artisans whose livelihoods and well-being are at risk during the pandemic. In India, 52% working in the creative economy are women, and in handicrafts in particular, 59% are expert craftswomen. The impact of COVID-19 may disproportionately position, delay positive progress against greater gender equality. As Monica also described from the work being done so wholeheartedly by India, with the colleagues in the United States and in India, we've also been working with the British Council with a particular partner in Northeast India, the Impulse NGO, who support women and their families who've also been the victims of tra trafficking. We've been working with them to support them getting back into their livelihoods through use of art and craft skills. In the recent few weeks in the UK, some other examples stand out of how arts and culture bring people together and how they can be a source of well-being and therapy. Neelam's story gave voice through dance to many thousands of people online who feel lost and isolated during COVID-19. Arts can enable difficult conversations that can be crucial to changing perceptions about mental health and well-being, which Neelam's story set out to do. The project brought together the South Bank Centre, Musician of the Year Rakesh Chauhan, with dancer Shaley Talwalker and Sampadas in Birmingham with the British Asian Trust. If you have a chance, do go to YouTube and look up the film, it's astonishing. For World Mental Health Day in October, the project raised awareness among the South Asian community in the UK of the power of arts to explore difficult stories for better well-being. And as I'm sure you'll know, the South, the South Asian community in the UK has been disproportionately affected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. A recent short film by the BBC Young Dance of the Year and frontline worker, Shri Savani, tells the story of COVID-19, of a victim who had been experiencing mental health issues. And through music and dance, the film recounts that story based upon a case study with the British Asian Trust, which is of course, as you will know, is supported by Royal Patron, 
His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. And again, I'd encourage you to, to look up the film online. Akram Khan Company has been supported by the British Council to work in India over several years now. And in the past week, he's produced a wonderful film released online, Our Animal Kingdom. It's a dance film which brings together professional and amateur dancers and the powerful performance made across the world to show how dance can truly connect us. The astonishing and disquieting film includes dances to bridge generations, race, gender, disability, and faith. From India, the film includes performance from Ad Aditi Mangada's dance company. Let's watch a short clip, clip from Our Animal Kingdom now. Okay, it looks like there may be a bit of a technical glitch, so we'll I'll move on and then hopefully we can get the glitch sorted by the end. I've got about one minute left on my speech just for the team at Kolkata Shanford, so we'll hopefully get the film back up shortly. But in the meanwhile, I'll just reach my conclusion. Um, British Council has been collaborating since March with Fiki and the Artex Company on the Taking the Temperature Report, which covers the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the creative economy in India. The second report will be released in this coming week. We know that in India, 88% of the creative industries are MSMEs. And now because of the pandemic, 16% is facing permanent closure, with a further 26% unsure that they'll be able to continue after March of next year. So with such huge challenges, challenges facing arts organizations, artists and artisans, the British Council is really pleased to continue to work with Kolkata Shanved to reach out across the digital frontiers, national boundaries, in solidarity with the many inspiring dancers and artists in India and beyond. This summit and the work of Kolkata Shanved, a vowed commitment to dance for movement therapy, is a critical factor in the nation's well-being and is truly inspiring. Um, and I'm really delighted to therefore be on this platform with colleagues from the United States and Germany um, with the British Council this evening. Now, if we're lucky, the film clip may be ready again. We'll try one last chance. Um, I'm going to hand back to you now, Keisha, just in case it's all good to go. And if it is, uh, we'll watch the film. Jonathan, yeah, we will try once. Once, yeah. Yeah. Okay, no problem.
Great, we got it to work. Very good. Okay, so that film was made, as you can probably have gathered, by Akram Khan Dance Company with dancers all over the world, and including those from India of care of Aditi Mangala's Dance Company. Uh, Keisha, back to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I think you, you left us on, on the perfect note. We are all inspired. So many um, inspiring moves there. And of course, appreciate your relationship with, with Kolkata Shomber and um, all the appreciative words. So thank you so much for your presence here this evening.